Hi everybody, this is the first of our two-part talk on arthritis imaging and uh, the way this talk is going to broke up is into two parts. The first part is about identifying whether an arthritis is primary or secondary and the second part is developing an approach to differentiating between the arthritis. In today's talk, we will talk about identifying an arthritis and determining whether it is primary osteoarthritis or a secondary arthritis. So I think the first thing to remember here is that all that is osteoarthritis is not osteoarthritis. Even though osteoarthritis is the most common kind of arthritis, all and all arthritis will progress to OA. It's important to know that if something looks like osteoarthritis, it is not always going to be osteoarthritis. And what are the clues that would tell you that something is not a primary osteoarthritis? So number one, is the age right? If it's a very young patient, potentially this would not be osteoarthritis or primary osteoarthritis. The second thing is if it's not a common joint for osteoarthritis, a weight bearing joint like the hip, knee, ankle, and sometimes the shoulder, then again, that's probably a reason to put a little bit of an alarm bell in your head that this may not be primary osteoarthritis. The third thing is when you look at the changes of osteoarthritis, typically we talk about joint space narrowing, subchondral sclerosis, cystic changes, and marginal osteophytes. If you see them in a sort of disproportionate pattern, you see a lot of joint space narrowing, but not a lot of sclerosis. Uh, you don't see enough osteophyte formation. That disproportion should alert you that something may not be osteoarthritis. And last but not least, look for any other clues that could tell you that something is not a primary osteoarthritis. So let's take a look at this example. This is a fairly typical example of primary osteoarthritis. We have the standard features of joint space narrowing. You can see that it is asymmetric. It's in the superolateral aspect of the joint, which is essentially the part of the joint which uh, is the weight bearing portion. So that's where you'd see maximum cartilage loss. You can see subchondral sclerosis and cystic change as well as marginal osteophyte formation. So here the asymmetric joint space narrowing, the subchondral cystic changes and sclerosis and the marginal osteophytes in the form of acetabular osteophytes as well as a ring osteophyte along the femoral head neck junction. Um, so here the age is typically going to be right. The common joint involved it is the hip. It's a proportionate OA, so you see all the changes of OA in a fairly proportionate manner, and there are no other clues. So these would all be indicators that this is fairly typical primary osteoarthritis. And so if I were to see this case and I were to say this is primary osteoarthritis, I would be reasonably happy with that answer. Let's move on to the next case where we look at this case. And here essentially we have the finger, uh, an image of the thumb and a finger. And what you can see is two joints that are involved, the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb as well as the second distal interphalangeal joint. And when we look at both of these, what you can see is the thumb CMC is a common location for osteoarthritis because we twiddle our thumbs all day. There is narrowing and cystic change and therefore I would be reasonably happy with calling this osteoarthritis. But when I look at the second distal interphalangeal joint, I see narrowing, I see osteophytes, but the distal interphalangeal joint, to be honest, is not a very common location for osteoarthritis. So because of its uncommon location, my signaling is awakened that says that this may not be a primary osteoarthritis. And then when we put our standard rules together, we say, is the age right? Uh, let's say we don't have the age information. Is it a common joint for osteoarthritis? No. So that sort of first of all starts the alerting process. Are there proportion and, and for the basal joint? Yes. Uh, is there, are there change, are there any other clues in this case? Um, and is there proportional osteoarthritis findings? So the findings are somewhat proportionate, but are there any other clues? And if we look at this a little bit closer, what you find is this is a pretty typical appearance for a condition called erosive osteoarthritis. And this you see from this gull wing appearance of the erosions in the joint. And the term gull wing comes from, if you remember, making drawings as little kids where you drew mountains, clouds, and sunshine, and then you drew the little birds flying in the sky. Those were the gull wings. So this is a pretty typical example of an erosive osteoarthritis in the distal interphalangeal joint and regular osteoarthritis at the basal joint of the thumb. Let's move on to this case. Here again, this looks like a pretty normal osteoarthritis when you look at it at first. So you see that there's joint space narrowing, but what you also see that 
the joint space narrowing is fairly typical the medial compartment is involved more than the lateral compartment and this is tricompartmental osteoarthritis but when you see there's a lot of joint space narrowing a lot of subchondral sclerosis but if you see a typically osteoarthritic knee you'd expect probably more osteophyte formation which is not quite as good in this case um, you also when you look at the lateral you almost get a sense that the lateral tibial plateau is a bit depressed and when you check on the age of this patient this patient is actually younger than usual when you look at a CT image, you see that there's actually a linear track of something metallic that was there before, which has since been removed. And so when you put this together, you have disproportionate osteoarthritis in a young patient with a tract. This makes you think of post-traumatic osteoarthritis. So this is again a condition where the main thing is that you don't see proportionate osteoarthritic findings. So that alerts you. You see that it's a young person and that sort of says that, oh, okay, that's why this is probably not primary osteoarthritis. And in terms of the other clues, you start to see the tract from a previous intervention, and then you know this could be primary, uh, this could be post-traumatic osteoarthritis. Let's look at this case now. We have again a case where we have joint space narrowing, we have subchondral sclerosis, subchondral cystic changes, and marginal osteophyte formation. And if you see that, we have all these features here. Um, but we also realize that the elbow is not a common joint for OA. So this sort of makes us start thinking of what could be the problem. When we look at this a little bit more closely, what we realize is that there is some deformity of the radial head. So when you see this deformity of the radial head, you may wonder whether somebody had surgery or not. We had no history of surgery in this patient. So when we sort of look at this case, we have, is the age right? Let's say we don't have the answer to that. Is it a common joint for OA? No. So it makes us think that this is probably not primary osteoarthritis. Are the changes proportionate for osteoarthritis? No, there's joint space narrowing, the subchondral sclerosis, but the osteophyte formation is a little bit small. And are there any other clues? Sure, there's deformity of the radial head. So when you put all of this together, what this is probably is a case of a long-standing process that has led to osteoarthritis. And when you look at the hand radiograph of this patient, what you find is there's crowding of the carpal bones with some cystic changes. And when you think of that, this is all fitting with rheumatoid arthritis. So this is end-stage rheumatoid arthritis affecting the elbow, uh, which is what you're seeing over here. Now let's look at this case here. Here we have the, a radiograph of the hands. And when we look at this, you see there is typical joint space narrowing, sclerosis and osteophyte formation, a fairly typical appearance for osteoarthritis. It is present in the first carpometacarpal joint, so the basal joints of the thumb, as well as the second and third metacarpophalangeal joints. So you can see these are the areas of osteoarthritis. Um, the first carpometacarpal joint, as we've talked about previously, is reasonably acceptable for being primary osteoarthritis. But the second and third metacarpophalangeal joints make us think a little bit and pause and say, is this really where we are seeing osteoarthritis? Um, so what we sort of start to look a little bit close, more closely at is, are there any other changes? And when we look a little bit closely at this, you can see definitely that the osteoarthritis is at the second and third metacarpophalangeal joints. And when we look at the wrist, one can see this calcification of the triangular fibrocartilage right here. So if we put this thing with our algorithm, it says, is the age right? We don't know the answer here. Is it a common joint for OA? For the metacarpophalangeal joints? Absolutely not. For the basal joint of the thumb, absolutely yes. Are the changes proportional for OA? Yes. Are there any other clues? Yes, there is a presence of calcification of the triangular fibrocartilage. And in addition, what you're seeing is involvement of the second and third metacarpophalangeal joints. And that pattern, when we put that together, is fairly classic for CPPD arthritis. So when you see this case, you can be very confident that this is a case of CPPD-related arthritis. So what I've tried to do in the last nine minutes or so is to explain to you that whenever you see osteoarthritis, it is the most common form of arthritis. But remember that every arthritis, infectious, inflammatory or any other cause will ultimately lead to osteoarthritis. So when you see a case of OA, think to yourself, is this the right age for OA? Is this the right joint for OA? Are the OA findings proportionate in terms of joint space narrowing, subchondral sclerosis, and marginal osteophyte formation? And are you seeing any other clues? So what we've discussed today is the first part of our arthritis, which is essentially the ability of us to identify an arthritis and to try and differentiate whether this is primary or secondary. So hopefully this sets into portion the first step of your looking at these cases 
and every time you see OA you start to question yourself as to whether this is truly OA of the primary kind or this is the end result of a secondary process. And in the next talk we'll talk about an approach to differentiating between the different types of inflammatory arthritis. Thank you.